<laughs> How are we? We welcome everyone to Did You Know, the ESCO HVAC show. And as many of you know, there are a lot of things that are happening in the HVAC and refrigeration industry right now. It's a very monumental time to be looking at changes and grasping the opportunity to better educate ourselves and be prepared for things as they are happening. You know, most of us have been in the industry and seen changes that happened along the way, like the CFC phase out and the HCFC phase out. And it brought its own challenges along the way. And we are going to have challenges in the next months, in the next few years. There's no doubt about that, is there? And I would say that there's probably not a single person in the industry right now that could look at the look at the daily task and say that they haven't been affected by something that has already happened. So every aspect of the HVAC and refrigeration industry is going to see some changes. Everyone will be affected in some way or another, whether it be in laws, rules, regulations, manufacturing, refrigerants, handling refrigerants, ordering parts to keep supplied, ordering inventory for vans. There are gonna be a lot of things that are happening in a short window of time. Now, if we look back about the history of where we have came from with refrigerant transitions, there have been things that have happened similar to this that may have gotten overlooked a little bit. So we want to talk about where we came from with refrigerants so that we can be prepared for the changes that we have. You know, I myself was in that late phase of the CFC uh, phase down, phase out, and the HCFC replacements as well. So I was doing HVAC and refrigeration at that time. So I had a lot of different refrigerants on my van. It wasn't like I just had two or three. I typically had eight or nine refrigerants on my van at all times. If I was working with a R12 system, I was replacing refrigerants based on the application. It could have been 414B, could have been 409. If it was a new application, new condensing system, it could have been going into a 134A. With a lot of our refrigerants, we've had multiple replacements and many of those have been blends over the years a lot of our 400 series refrigerants. Well, now we're starting to move into new classifications of refrigerants, particularly the A2L and the A3 generations. And that's really what we wanna talk about today is what has happened with the A2L classification and how do we distinguish those refrigerants? Because most refrigerants will have some type of a flammability under certain conditions. So now we have to look at refrigerants and especially ones that are still yet to come to go, okay, what classification exactly are these in and how are we going to validate that process along the way? And so our good friends at Camores are joining us today and we're gonna dive into that topic and we're thankful to have you with us today. So when we look at refrigerants and we look at where Camores has been in the industry, they have been around for over 90 years. And a lot of people don't understand that relationship that it all started with the DuPont refrigerants. And now that we start talking about new brands of refrigerants in that Optium class, it's important to see where Freon played its way in. A lot of people will reference Freon as R12, right? Heard that many times in the, over the years. Well, there was really a variety of different refrigerants that fell under that Freon branding. And as we move into Optium, we'll start seeing that as well. We'll have a variety of refrigerants that are going to be marketed for the Optium refrigerant product line. And I wanna be able to talk about where those are and where we're going with them. So if we look at A2Ls and we look at A3s over a, a longer window of time, we will find out that neither one are actually new to the industry. The classification that we have all from ASHRAE 34 sets the standards for these. And now we can start applying, we can start plugging the refrigerants into the proper classification so that we know how to handle those refrigerants. If we look at things like A3s, we actually were using A3s back in the early 1800s with ether, a very flammable refrigerant. If it was being used today, it would be in that A3 classification along with things like R290 and R600. Now those refrigerants are being used in a lot of applications. They have been for a decade or more. So they're not really new. We're just new to the awareness of some of them. Now with our A2L refrigerants, the most prominent refrigerant in that A2L class is going to be our R1234YF. And it itself is relatively new to our industry, but it is not new to the world of refrigerants. It has its roots a very long time ago, and we'll dive into one of those other refrigerants that falls similar into that class. It's been around for a few decades. An A2L generation like R1234YF 
has made its way into other industries and has been very successful. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Even in my own ventures, I found 1234 quite a few years ago before I realized how prominent it was going to be in our new refrigerants. I actually, I had bought a 2016 Ram in 2017. And the very first thing that I did was started opening doors, hatches, inspecting everything. I'm a vehicle nut. I like automobiles. So it was a brand new truck. Very first thing is to figure this thing out. And along that path, I ran into this little sticker and I went, well, that's an interesting one. 2016, we were already putting 1234YF in vehicles. So we bought a different vehicle in 2020, bought a little Kia, much to the surprise, 1234YF as well. So the automotive industry is very aware of 1234YF. And out of curiosity, for those that are with us today, we've got the chat boxes running. So anyone that wants to hop into the chat box and uh, join us for this questionnaire, in what year do you think 1234YF was actually introduced? <clears throat> we'll give that just a minute or so. Let people hop in here. So when we look at 1234YF, what we actually find out is that it was introduced in 2008 to the Society of Automotive Engineers, SAE. And so the automotive industry started looking in 2008 at 1234YF as being the resolution to replace 134A in vehicles. Well, that is a little bit of the history behind our 1234YF, this A2L. And now we want an opportunity to dive in with our OEMs of this particular refrigerant, 1234YF, to get a better understanding of what we're doing with it how we're classifying it, and how it will play with other refrigerants going forward. So Don Gillis, love for you to join us today and dive a little deeper. Okay, Cliff. Well, let's start out with this one. You've probably seen this many a times in different graphics, different flavors and sizes. Uh, notice the green box there. Well, prior to the 1930s, before we came up with R12, that was actually uh, invented in Dayton, Ohio, just down the road from our map by a man named Kettery. And it was for GM, as, as Cliff touched on a little bit. But as you can see, the beginning of the turn of the century, we had, you know, refrigerants like sulfur dioxide, ammonia. And so we were happy to see R12 come along for safety reasons, basically. Right. Well, to replace the flammable refrigerants. Exactly. Spot on. And, and and as you can see in the green box, many of these refrigerants we have utilized in the air conditioning industry. And the refrigerants were always classified as A1. Uh, some people say no toxicity or or no flammability, and as right. Cliff touched on very well, I, I usually say no. Because <laughs> anything parts per million, including CO2, will asphyxiate you, so you have to be careful with that. And That's if right. you add enough heat to R22, even uh, it will, you know, obviously explode. So, but today's conversation is going to be, if you will, the new kid on the block, the A2Ls, uh, and then we're getting to the HFOs. We went from R22 to HCFCs. Look, it's a little lower than the ODP, as you can mm -hmm. see, but it's higher in GWP because we weren't really focused on that, were we? Not we at the time. Really, no, we weren't. If you think about it, we were focused on that ozone. It was it was putting that fire out. It's kind of like when we first started in the industry, you know, asbestos was really a bad word. And now mold became that new asbestos word, you know. Exactly. So it's kind of the same thing from ozone to GWP. Transitioned along exactly. the path. Exactly. You know, the things you don't know. You don't know what you don't exactly know. Exactly right. So from R to R22, then we moved into what we have. Believe it or not, I, I, I when uh, Jeff pointed this out to me the other day, uh, 1990s. That's 30 years ago. Isn't that, that crazy? Seems like yesterday, you know, yeah. it seems like yesterday. I remember 1991. Thinking, we got the initial patent for R410A. I yeah. Do what? <laughs> uh, it was, it, it, when he said that to me, I yeah. thought, has it really been that long? But it has. Yeah. So. Uh, so it, so it's not like we're changing every two years, you know, this, no. it's, a, it's had a good ride. And uh, so now we, we still don't have any ODP, but it has a higher GWP. We actually went up and I'll show you on the next slide, uh, I believe, where we actually went up higher in GWP from uh, 410A from R22. But again, the fire to put out then was uh, that ozone depletion. OK, exactly and here right. we are today at HFOs, HFO blends. Uh, examples would be R32, 454B uh, from Comores, no ODP, very low GWP. Look, this is what it's all about. This whole conversation, no matter what flavor you're choosing, what application, it's about in the uh, getting that environmental impact lower 
uh, raising the efficiency of our equipment, and and thirdly, getting those emissions down. Okay, and and it just it, it and that's really what it's all about. And as Cliff touched on earlier, these numbers come from what we refer to as ASHRAE th Standard 34. Mm -hmm. So let's slip on to the next slide, if you would, Cliff. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this one here, it's uh, here we're talking about. It, they're blocked right now on the screen with the 1234YF. But really what they're saying here is HFOs, uh, they're double bonded, okay? Mm -hmm. And what that means is is they break up easier in the atmosphere, okay? You can't see it on the right hand where it says double bonded, but those two molecules are, are carbon molecules. And anytime you have two molecules that are the same connected, it's referred to as double bonded and they break up much quicker. I mean, we're looking at as the example there they're giving at 134A is uh, the difference from 14 years in the atmosphere as opposed to 12 days, 1234. The bottom exactly. line is most all refrigerants that I can think of with the exception of maybe ammonia has some global warming potential. And that number is based off CO2. It's really by metric uh, uh, carbons, basically. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but uh, that's what that's for. And I do apologize. I had the lineup evidently different than what I was given. So. Yeah. No, and so that's a really interesting point. When we talk about the HFO, we really are talking about a synthetically modified HFC that has a different bond on our carbon-based atoms. So we're using that olefin base or an alkene base, which does that double bonding of the refrigerant that allows it to break up faster as it enters into the atmosphere. That's the reason we have that lower GWP off of our refrigerant. Very stable at lower atmospheric and under pressure conditions. And then as we introduce into higher atmospheres, it is easy to break down. So its longevity has been significantly reduced over our HFC refrigerants that we've seen in the past. Right. Yep. Yeah. And, and like I say, I, I think a lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about, like you say, every refrigerant does have a GWP value. And, you know, we're, we're not going to spend much time today in um, the, the regulatory side because that could take right. up the whole time. Slot. But that'll be a separate one. We'll actually yeah. definitely do that one as a separate yeah. cast. But in this case, every GWP, every refrigerant has a GWP. And in this case, the higher it is, the worse off it is to the environment. And right. so we thought just a great way to show the example. Like you said, our 410 has been around for almost 30 years now. What you see here is our 410A has a GWP of 2,088. And now most of you know that our 410A is 50% R32 and 50% R125. And with that two combination, each one of those refrigerants, R32 and R125, they have their own GWP value. You mix those two together and that's how you come up with the GWP of 2,088. Right. The reason that 125 was introduced back 30 years ago to R32 is that the industry was not ready for the next classification of refrigerants. We, we wanted to stay in that A1 category, right. and that's why R125 was introduced as, as almost like a flame suppressant, because R32 by itself actually is an A2L refrigerant. Correct. And so... Go ahead, Cliff, you can move to the sure. next. Sure, uh, absolutely. Topic. And I think it's very fascinating to talk about that difference is that R32 was an A2L type of refrigerant in 1991. We just weren't ready for a flammable refrigerant. And right. so we took a very common refrigerant, which is R125. At that time, it was used as a chemical um, flame suppressant. And mm -hmm. we were able to take that flame suppressant, mix it with R32, bring that flammability into the classification that we were comfortable with. And then in the process of that, we increased our global warming potential. So we satisfied our ODP and we satisfied our flammability, not really paying as much focus to the fact that we actually went significantly up in global warming potential. Right. Because, I mean, like I say, we won't go too deep into the regulatory side, but the Kigali Amendment, which is dealing with the GWP or global warming potential, wasn't until 2016. And so... You can imagine if an OEM introduces 410A back in the mid-1990s in their equipment, they've probably already got a handful of years of R&D work R &D that behind was it. already done, right? You know, exactly. So we're talking right at the very beginning of 1990s, um, 410A was introduced, and like you say, GWP was just not on anybody's radar. On our radar at the moment. 
So, yep. But now it is right. And so, you know, the, one of the good refrigerant choices, as you can see here is R 454 B. And you can see all we did was basically we removed that R125, which by itself has a GWP like over 3,500. <laughs> very, right? very high. Yeah, yeah. So we, we, we kept the R32 and we introduced R1234YF, which is like Cliff, you, so, you showed, is going in the automobile air conditioners right now. Mm -hmm. And that has a GWP of four. Right, on so its own. You blend that in with the R32, and that's where you can see um, R454B has a GWP of 466. Now, what's cool about this is is we w we've introduced R454A, mm -hmm. B, and C. So we actually that's have right. an R454A, R454B, and an R454C. And all it is is playing with those two compositions change the composition of 32 and YF, we can make a uh, medium temp R22 uh, type of refrigerant. And so you're going to see moving forward a lot of introductions of this R454, either A, B, or, B C. or C. And then like you say, YF has already been, been introduced into uh, the automobile air conditioners. But both R32 and R1234YF have an ASHRAE standard 34 classification of an A2L. Right. And this is where, you know, um, Don said a little bit earlier, you get any refrigerant hot enough and it will burn. And this is where the misconception or a whole lot of misinformation has gone out. You can see this chart on the right hand side says, lower toxicity or higher toxicity, right? Mm -hmm. If anybody here on the call is dealing with uh, ammonia, right? It is exactly, a, well, but it has a higher toxicity. Lower toxicity is just a value that's been assigned by ASHRAE. But you can see everything that we've been dealing with in the air conditioning industry, whether it's R22 or 410A, it's not that it's non-flammable, it just shows that it's no flame propagation. And we'll talk about that here in just a few minutes. So R410A, R22, they've always had this A1 classification, which is lower toxicity, not no toxicity. Not none, right. just lower. Right, and then it's not that it's non-flammable, it's just that there's no flame propagation based on this ASHRAE standard 34 testing that goes on. And so what we really want to get into the rest of this presentation is to talk about something that most people really don't talk about, but it's the testing that all yes. the refrigerants go through in exactly. Ashley Standard 34. And that is the important part of it because, you know, we know that all 400 series refrigerants are blended refrigerants all the way from 410A. That's the reason that it is a four uh, generation refrigerant is that it is a blended refrigerant. And I think as we move forward, we're going to see a variety of blended refrigerants falling into these classifications. And so understanding not just about how they are as a blended refrigerant and the glides that are associated with some of those, but understanding exactly what that testing is to validate the flammability of a refrigerant. I think it'll be crucial going forward because now we'll have equipment and we'll have uh, the tools that are appropriate for certain types of applications. And that's where the standard comes into play is validating what these refrigerants will look like. So yeah. it's really interesting when we see the testing procedure to know exactly where those classification boundaries are. Yep. Yeah. And so what, you, what you're seeing on this slide here is one of the tests that uh, all refrigerants go through. Uh, it's like an apples to apples comparison. And so ASHRAE standard 34, they have separate committees, right? They have a committee on toxicity and then they have a committee on flammability. And so, you know, twice a year ASHRAE gets together and you may get new refrigerants introduced. But bottom line is this one here, what we're going to talk about is the flammability of a refrigerant. So what happens is a vessel gets filled with refrigerant and with air, and then you can't see it real good, but at the very bottom of that, that vessel, it's, it's mixed together mm -hmm. and then an ignition source is, is lit. And so what happens is, if you go to the next slide, I think um, 
it shows this is what happens with a refrigerant, much like R410A, right? Right. And so it's when we say no flame propagation, they've established this V shape or basically a 90 a degree perimeter. says, yeah, a parameter that says if the refrigerant we will we make it hot enough the ignition source hot enough to where the refrigerant does ignite but as long as that refrigerant stays within that 90 degree parameter it could be 89 degrees but as long as it stays within that 90 degrees or less than 90 degrees it's saying no flame propagation so you know we've been going through this work with these a2ls for you know over 10 years uh in preparation for coming out with you know residential applications or light commercial and one of the organizations we had to work with was the fire department and so that's right they've done all the research and that was just a little snippet you can see here they basically say many refrigerants uh categorized as non-flammable so they're even misusing a little misinterpretation no propagation yeah um but they say such as r410 and r22 can burn under the right conditions. And so what you see here is a perfect example of say R410A, the refrigerant's ignited, but it stays within that 90 degrees. So mm -hmm. it gets that one classification or an A1 because of the lower toxicity. So remember that slide I showed just a few minutes ago that said, if we've got to push down on the GWP, we're gonna push up on that flammability. Right. And when we did R454B as an example, we have R32 and R1234YF. So the picture on the right-hand side could be R454B. All we have to do is go beyond 90 degrees. So it could be 92, 93 degrees. Once you go beyond that... New classification. Standard, standard 34, it's considered flammable. Exactly. Now... There's degrees of flammabilities as well. And now I'm, my son, he's in the trucking industry, and you know he says, Dad, it's either flammable or it's not. <laughs> right. Nope. We're working hard to explain that there are degrees of flammability. So back to these organizations. We've had to work with DOT and OSHA and all these other organizations to help them understand what we're talking about on this particular slide right here. So once it goes beyond 90 degrees, how does that flame react? Is it very quick or is it very slow reacting? And so that's what you know. You find out with an A2L that it's a, it's, it's a very lazy flame. And unfortunately that doesn't show a good example. The class one and the class two, these flames are very lazy with inside that vessel versus um, I think if you go to the next slide that we had in here, and I do have a video real quick. I'll pop that in here for us. So okay. this is a clip of Dr. Chuck's video we put out yesterday showing the actual device and the flame for that. Very good. And that's in our discovery hub that's uh, just outside of Wilmington, Delaware. And really cool facility. The automotive industry has already worked through all these uh, conditions, right? You know, even shipping and handling, right? You know, if you walk into a, a, a Napa or AutoZone or, you know, O'Reilly's Auto Parts, right? You can see R1234YF sitting on the shelf, right? Readily available. Yep, yep. So, you know, these are examples of just the testing that every refrigerant goes through to get that R designation. And so the next slide, I think, shows, you know, what we captured is that still shot, right? You've yeah. got lower flammability, flammable, or higher flammability. And once again, it's how the flame reacts and how far does it spread type of thing. You can see that that bottom vessel is an, a class three or an A3 like R290, which hopefully everyone knows R290 is a propane. Purified refrigerant. propane. Yeah. And you see that, you know, if you bought a new refrigerator in the last handful of years, you probably have R600A, which is an isobutane, but that still is an A3 refrigerant. Yeah. And so 
what we try to get out of this presentation today is for everyone to understand that these new classifications of refrigerants that are coming out in residential, light commercial, even you know bigger even commercial if you're doing refrigeration work, mm -hmm. it's much more, these 2L or A2L refrigerants are much more like a class one or an A1 refrigerant like R410A, R407C, 404A, R22, right? It's just that the flame spread has gone beyond that 90 degrees. And so what do we have to do with it? And so, you know, there's a whole lot of other discussions that we can go into, um, you know, what's the equipment going to look like? You know, uh, what's the tools going to look like? And, exactly. and that's what, if you go, you know, to many sites like uh, ATRI, they have a safe refrigerant transition task force. Um, Which we um, have a member on that task force. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think both of us are, right? You know, um, and, you know, several videos to go into more depth, yeah. you know, explanation about, you know, if you've bought a new uh, recovery machine or a new vacuum pump, it may already be re uh, rated for these two L refrigerants. And so if, the, if you're buying new equipment, I would definitely check with, you know, your wholesalers and that to make sure that, what you're buying is forward compatible. You know, don't buy the, the cheapest one. Make sure that it's rated for these new 2L refrigerants. And you won't see much of a difference, right? It, it's going to be very subtle uh, difference, especially if it's brushless DC motors. You know, you won't see much of a difference. You might see that the fan might be a little bit bigger to move more air through the recovery machines or vacuum pumps, different things like that. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it really is that you know all refrigerants if you get them hot enough will ignite and that's what the fire department found out as well you can go out to um ul or the fsri i believe it's fire safety refrigerant research or F I i can't remember the acronym now right but, uh, you know Where they're doing researches on the flammability of yeah. gases and, and obviously they were concerned, right? They hear about a new refrigerant and, and most people, as soon as they hear the word flammable, they immediately run to that R290, right? Exactly. So highly flammable. And when the fire department worked with UL and all bunch of industry experts, um, they found out that these new refrigerants like R454B or R32 or r 1234 yf um, when exposed to a, a fire you know they basically put a, a fan coil into a room and set the room on fire with right? open flame mm -hmm. yeah and then waited for the aluminum coil to melt and then the refrigerant was released into that existing fire in and, high volume you know that's the thing in a very isolated high volume incident yep and our 454b and r410a reacted very similar so Basically, the fire department says, we understand now that these new refrigerants, you know, uh, we know how to, to, to work around them, right? You exactly. still have the same PPE. And that's what you're going to have as a technician installing and then servicing either a 410A system or a new A2L like R454B. There's going to be certain PPE that you need, certain practices that you need to uh, deal with. And if you're already doing best practices, this transition is going to be very easy. It's not like um, uh, R22 to 410A, right? You know, right. Don and I are old enough, and I, yeah, Clifton, you're old enough too, that, you know, when we went through uh, uh, R22 <laughs> to 410A, you know. There was a like lot of relearning time. in that time period. It was. And so what you're going to find out moving forward that this new refrigerant, R454B has the same operating pressures, very similar, you know, um, oils and everything else, even the gauges, you know, you won't have to change. Um, it, it's going to be a much more subtle change. It's going to be some additional installation practices, but that's when you go to the equipment manufacturer's training and you find out, you know, here's what you need to do slightly different, but exactly. you know, you know, ESCO, I know, has got, you know, an eight uh, flammable refrigerant training class. Mm -hmm. It's really important to understand what you're working with, right? 
And a lot of people didn't even realize that R410A in that class one, you know, it wasn't that it was non-flammable. It's non, no flame propagation beyond that. Niche. Beyond that perimeter. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy. So, Did I you? mean, you know, that's the type of thing. And I don't know, Don, you know, I don't know if you got any other comments or anything. Well, you know, there's a couple things I... There's a couple things I want to point out, uh, not really off topic, uh, but a little bit off of what you said. One thing I want to establish here today, because there's a lot of misconception out there, and I think we beat it to death already. There are no hydrocarbons in A2L refrigerants. That's there you one. go. That's a great point. That was that's one good. question that needed to be answered it, for the topic, it, it, and it that's exactly popped, it. Yeah, thank you. It gets popped up all the time, and I would yes. really kick myself in the butt if I didn't. we didn't take advantage of that right now. The yeah. the other thing, too, is... is um, uh, the, the A2L refrigerants. I know we all know this. Everyone that's tuned in knows this. But for the folks that don't tune into so shows like this and, and, and things, there will be no incident where you'll be able to take that A2L refrigerant and put it in an existing A1 system. Okay, exactly. So you're, you're, not, you're never going to do that. It's all new equipment. So, and I know we all know that. But those are two things I think we need to start ringing that bell now and make it very clear because there's a big misconception about hydrocarbons. I've had people walk up to me since I've been here and it's just not anyways. Uh, and the, the last but not least, a fun fact on the thing about the R32 is we talked about oils, but for Copeland, for example, you're going to have a, an, an A2L refrigerant compressor uh, for 454B. Now it's going to be an A2L refrigerant. The oil is going to be 32 PoE like the 410A, Mm -hmm. Still not interchangeable because of the A2Ls. And then you're going to have R32. Now it's A2Ls, but it runs a little hotter. That R125 was for fire deterrent, but also the heat of the discharge line. R32 right. by itself runs a little hotter. So that 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 oil is going to be a 46. It's going to be a higher viscosity. Higher temperature, yes. Just, just something to think about. Yep. No, and that's all good things. And that's the reason we want to have these conversations. We want to take the topics that people are very afraid of. Because when we start talking about replacement refrigerants and they hear that word, they immediately go to A3 refrigerants going, oh my gosh, we are going to have a lot of difficulties in this. And so going forward, we will have different representatives from the industry diving into what are going to be the proper R410A replacement style refrigerants. Because we haven't even gotten into that. We're just talking about new equipment right now. Right. Talking about the replacement of refrigerants and new equipment. So you got to remember just exactly like we talked about when we were leaving away from like the CFCs, when we were leaving away from R12, the two primary replacements for new equipment were going to be 134A in medium temp and 404 in low temp. And that was the most common new equipment replacements for these same types of equipment. But if we were doing repairs and we were doing refrigerant replacements on existing systems, that's where we had to start looking at other blended refrigerants like our 414s and our 409s to be able to see what was going to be the appropriate replacement refrigerant. So that is a whole nother topic in itself. That's why it's so yeah. important for us to be able to Good have point. these conversations with the people who are seeing it firsthand, because this is the beginning of a variety of topics that are going to need quality, trusted education. And if we can get it directly from the manufacturers and the trainers and the representatives of the industry, then we can paint a larger picture of why these changes are here, how to properly handle these changes, what was all of the deciding factors to get to that point to begin with, and what are some potential things to be looking forward in the future. So it's not that we're trying to, uh, we're not trying to paint a picture that is unattainable. We're trying to remove the stigma that is already being established and trying to correct it with proper training and right. good education. So and, Clifton, if you yes. can go back to like slide, I'm going to say two or three, it was the refrigerant history. Yes. And really, so, you know, oop, yeah, you had oop, you clicked too many times. Yeah. It was that refrigerant almost. That little right lineage. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, really what, what, what we're dealing with, like you say, is HFOs, which it, like R1234YF is a, a, a pure refrigerant. And then Single when you see HFO on. blends, right? That's where R454A or B or C has a mixture of YF plus, in this case, R32. Um, and I, I see one of the questions over in the, in the chat box is saying, you know, is there an R410A replacement? Um, right now, there there isn't. 
And so what that brings up that's not on this chart here, and I wanted to bring it up, is reclaim is going to be such an important part of this refrigerant journey Absolutely. like we've never had before. And folks are doing pretty good with R22, but um, not so well with R410A. And so right. since there is no R410A uh, replacement, R410A is not going to be phased out. That's another important piece of this puzzle. Like R22 and R12 was a phase out under out. Montreal Protocol. So we're kind of going into the regulatory, which I knew we would. But <laughs> um, the, the Kilgali Amendment and what's happened in the United States, something called the AIM Act, is a phase down, not a phase out. So That's R410A right. will not go away, but it will be phased down. And so every refrigerant's got a GWP value and the higher GWPs will be more impacted by these phase downs versus the lower GWP refrigerants. So those that are listening on this call, if you currently aren't reclaiming and returning R410A, please do it. Talk with, if you go to a, a distributor and they're not reclaiming it, Find one that is because our 410A is going to be valuable uh, as we move forward. Very valuable. If I wanted to say uh, reclaim our 410A. So, yeah. So exactly. to answer that question about, you know, our 410A replacements, right now there is no uh, silver bullet like R4, R22, right? You know, you've got a couple options out there, you know, uh, new 22B or MO99, you know, those, those designations like r 422B or mm -hmm. our, uh, 438A, those type of things. That was replacements for R22. But right now, there is no R410A replacement for an A1 classification that we're showing here on that chart. You cannot change classifications, which is what Don said. You cannot put an A2L refrigerant into an Back A1. into an A1 system. Right. And we'll even say that, you know, you wouldn't change, you wouldn't put 410A into a, an R454B system. You just don't change the classifications. That's where UL and ASHRAE standards that are involved in all this, either designing of the equipment or installations, you know, that's what, you know, any people that are here on codes and standards or, you know, uh, maybe an HJ might be listening in. Um, yeah you know, it's important that the new codes and standards get in place. And so this slide here, while we don't talk about it a whole lot on this journey, maybe we need to put out there in another box, reclaim R410A <laughs> or if you're doing commercial refrigeration, reclaimed 404A. 404 significantly. Woo. And we will be diving into that. So we actually have a representative from the uh, the recovery and the recycling process Excellent. so that we'll be able to talk about why that demand of doing proper recovery and recycling of refrigerants and how that is going to affect refrigerant supplies and pricing going forward. Because that's another thing that technicians don't always think about is that they do have the opportunity to impact the price of refrigerants down the road based on the amounts of refrigerants that we are going to be able to recover from the field now and turn back into usable products at our refineries. So that is a uh, topic in its own that we'll be covering here on Did You Know? Yeah. So good stuff, guys. Have we got anything that we want to cover before we hop out of here? I definitely want to get to our follow-up side so that we can show people how they can get better resources from Comores because there's a lot of things out there that will help support this type of training. You know, we're going to see opportunities for technicians to become deeper educated in these topics as we move forward. We're so grateful for you guys to be here. We want to make sure that people... Um, have the opportunity to learn more about Comores. So you want to check them out at www.comores.com. When you're on YouTube, you want to go over to the Comores company. And um, guys, I really appreciate you being here with us. Oh, and on LinkedIn, we'll make sure to hop over to the Comores company at LinkedIn. So anything that we'd like to dive into deeper uh, on this topic of A2L refrigerants? Yeah, the only thing I was going to say is the one thing that's on the very far right-hand side is um, uh, check up with Dr. Chuck. 
Yes. So folks that have dialed into this thing, you know, and listening about refrigerants, check up with Dr. Chuck. I don't know, Don, are there, what, 40? We're in our third season, you know, 40 some different uh, little pieces of information on refrigerants go deeper than you'd ever thought we could. It's amazing that stuff. He's a phenomenal person. Yes. Excellent. And those looking for more information on low GWP, the ESCO Institute has a, uh, a low GWP training program, and we'd really like for you to take a look at that. And uh, next week, we'll be diving into some of the ACA uh, documentation on getting into multi-split and mini-split, looking at load calculations, looking at equipment that we'll be moving into in the future. Can't wait to talk about some of the changes that are happening in that sector of the industry. So every week, we'll have a new topic from industry professionals, and we'll get a little bit closer to all of these changes that are happening so that you are better educated so that you have a resource in the industry that wants to help you succeed. A lot of resources when it really comes down to it. So we thank you guys for joining us. We look forward to all of our future guests and OEMs and professionals and um, experts of the industry. And we will see you all next week on Did You Know? The ESCO HVAC Show. <laughs>